All right, Semester Astronomy, welcome back for the final time this year. Special shout out to you sophomores and juniors. Senior grades are now in, but this is going to be your last assignment since you have about another week of school. And double special shout out to the seniors. Some of you said that you didn't want to miss the summer sky on your charts. So those of you that are still tagging along to plot it out, that is absolutely legit. So we are going to be today on our SCO1s or our SCO1Ts. And remember, the publishing company actually changed the name of these, which was super duper annoying. So some of you might have one that says SCO01. Some of you might have one that just says SCO1. Doesn't matter, means the same exact thing. So that's what we're going to be using. Some of you might even be using the SCO04T because Sky and Publishing had some crazy stuff going on. They were actually out of the one T's. So if you are using the four T, it's almost the same, but because it's set for the year zero AD rather than 2000, everything on the chart is just gonna be shifted ever so slightly one way or the other, but everything is still here. Also on Google Classroom, I'm gonna post this summertime sky list right here for you. So make sure that you reference that as you're getting your plot on. Okay, so let's take a look here. Summertime sky is probably the most beautiful sky of the year. I put it right up there with the wintertime sky. So it's a darn shame that we didn't get to do this one in class. Let's go ahead now, ooh, see what I did there? Let's go ahead and jump to the chart that you all have been using from home. Now you might recall before the quarantine, we started on our equatorial chart by plotting our winter time sky. So if you're following along, you all should have this sky already mapped from class. Then your first star chart plotting assignment at home, we plotted the spring sky on that side and over here as well. So now we're on to the skies of summer, which you'll be able to see high overhead all summer long. It's absolutely stunning. So this is the easier of our charts. It's the more minimal one. This is our 001 chart. This is where you just have to connect the dots. So first up, we have a little parallelogram, which is basically the fancy math teacher term for slanty rectangle. This is Lyra the harp. Ooh, my fingernails are dirty. Sorry, everybody, I've been gardening a lot. I apologize, my fingernails are dirty. That's embarrassing. All right, so in mythology, this is the harp that Orpheus used to sneak his way into the underworld to rescue his woman Eurydice and bring her back. Because in Greek and Roman mythology, the afterworld, the underworld, wasn't really like a separate realm of existence or like a different dimensional plane like a lot of the world's religions think about it today. It was basically a physical place separated from the realm of the living by the river of the dead, which we learn in academic astronomy is Eratinus. So every now and then you have some heroes tricking the boatman, Sharon or Karen, and sneaking across the river to visit their loved ones. And so that's where Lyra the Harp comes from. Has an incredibly bright star, Vega, and a beautiful object we're going to talk about on the next chart. Next up, look for a gigantic and almost symmetrical cross shape on the sky. We're going to see that's an asterism called the Northern Cross. But for now, we just need to know the constellation. This is one of our two birds we have on the sky. This is Cygnus the Swan with the bright star Deneb in its tail feathers. Then south of that, we have our second bird. This is Aquila the Eagle with its bright star Altair in its tail feathers. Personally, I don't like how the star chart shows Aquila. I think of it a little differently. I think of this smaller triangle shape as the eagle's body. There's an eagle wing, there's an eagle wing, then out here is the head. Either way, this is Aquila the Eagle. Next up, a fairly small dim constellation, but still very conspicuous and easy to see on the night sky. We have Delphinus the dolphin. Looks like a little kite shape. This is the dolphin's body, and perhaps there's his tail trailing behind it. Okay, let's head south. This, everybody, is my favorite part of the whole night sky. 
The center of our Milky Way goes right through the middle of this spot. So we have a lot of bright stars and easy to find constellations. And first up, one of my two favorite on the sky, we have Sagittarius the Archer. And we'll talk a little bit more about him on the next chart. Not only does he contain an asterism that we have, but he has two beautiful naked eye nebulae right above him there. He is actually a centaur in mythology. You might recall those from the Harry Potter books. They are half man or woman and then half horse. So the torso of a man or woman and the body of a horse, very, very strong and smart. But we actually have another centaur in the southern sky. So this centaur, Sagittarius, we know him as the archer. And finally, hands down my favorite constellation of the whole night sky. It's almost tragic that here at more northern latitudes, it lurks very, very low above the horizon and is only briefly seen during the summer months. This is Scorpius, the mighty scorpion, with the blood red heart of the scorpion, the massive red supergiant Antares. In mythology, this is the scorpion that stings Orion the mighty hunter on his ankle and knocks him dead. So that's why, according to Greek mythology, Orion is now in the wintertime sky. And then Scorpius is banished here to the skies of summer, so they never do battle again. Okay, this should be an easy 10-point grade in Google Classroom. You just need to trace these six constellations. We had Lyra the Harp, Cygnus the Swan, Aquila the Eagle, Delphinus the Dolphin, Sagittarius the Archer, and Scorpius the Scorpion. All right, feel free to pause the video, and then when you hit play, we'll head to the T-chart. Ooh, voila. Okay. For semester astronomy, there is a good bit that we need to plot on the T-chart, including not one, not two, but three asterisms. We need three asterisms. Oh, and I just realized I did not plot my asterism here. I'm just going to put the phone down for one second. I'm going to leave this action running. It's going to happen right there. Whoop. All right, this is the tough thing when you do one-shot videos. Come back into focus. Come back now. All right, so a little bit more of a challenge here on the T-chart. First, let's go through the constellations. Then we're going to add the asterisms in. Lyra, despite being teeny tiny small, is home to not one but two very significant objects. It is home to a top 10 brightness star, the bright star Vega, which was actually the first star ever photographed. Then right in here, please highlight the diamond shape, which means a nebula. This is M57, the ring nebula. Please look a picture up sometime online or on your phones. It looks like a beautiful smoke ring in outer space. Where a star like our sun, but older, poof, blew off its outer layers, and that became a planetary nebula. You can't see it with the naked eye. But through a decent backyard telescope, I'd say probably at least like a six-inch telescope, look right between these two stars at the bottom of the heart, and you see a beautiful smoke ring in outer space. By the way, if you want a real treat with a smaller telescope, immediately to the left of Vega, we have what's called a double-double, two pairs of double stars for four stars total, so check that out. So Lyra the Harp, small constellation, but a lot going on. Over here, please plot Cygnus the Swan with its bright star Deneb in its tail feathers. And then we have Aquila the Eagle with its bright star Altair in its tail feathers. Now, let's knock out two of our three asterisms. The most gigantic asterism we have on the sky, easy to see all summer long, is called the Summer Triangle. It connects the bright stars Vega, in Lyra the Harp, with Deneb in Cygnus the Swan, and finally Altair in Aquila the Eagle. So draw a dotted line from Vega through Deneb down through Altair. There it is, our summer triangle. 
The Northern Cross is a little bit trickier because it's almost the same shape as Cygnus the Swan. Basically, as they're showing Cygnus to you here, just leave this star out. Because notice, teens, if we eliminate that star right there, look at the nice symmetrical cross shape we get. Please add a dotted line. That's our Northern Cross. Part of Cygnus the Swan, easy to see. Okay, before we head south, don't forget to also add in the cute little constellation Delphinus the Dolphin. Okay, down to the southern hemisphere. No, not the southern hemisphere. The southern part of the northern hemisphere. I just realized I forgot to add in my favorite asterism here in Sagittarius. So I'm going to put the phone down for a second. While I add it in, go ahead and plot out the shape you see for Sagittarius the Archer. <laughs> Plotting out my asterisms. I'm a big star chart. Gonna look so nice. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Oops, I made a mistake. Almost done, everybody. I'll put, pick the phone up in just one sec, I promise. All right. Also within Sagittarius, despite it being a strong and mighty archer and centaur, we have a dainty little asterism called the teapot. Check it out. Here is its handle, here is its spout, here is its lid, here is its bowl. And when he gets all steamed up, we could even think of the Milky Way as the steam rising off the teapot. So go ahead and just add a dotted line for the center part of Sagittarius. Not this part right here, just this part. That's our asterism, the teapot. Above the teapot spout, we have not one, but two naked eye objects. So unlike M57, you actually can see these two with the naked eye in a dark place relatively free of light pollution. This is M8, the Lagoon Nebula, and M20, the Trifid Nebula. Don't forget about your vocab list. Not only do we have the four steps here, but you can also see all of the common names. So those are beautiful star-forming regions right above Sagittarius. Finally, in Scorpius the Scorpion, the ancients knew Antares as the heart of the scorpion because it's blood red just like a heart would be. And if you imagine the scorpion's body here, that's about where the heart would be. By the way, the scorpion used to be a lot fiercer and the pincher claws used to go way out to here. But then in more modern times, they actually chopped them off to make that a separate constellation called Libra the Scales leaving our scorpion with the stubby pinchers it has today. Still, I think you'd agree with me, this looks a lot more like its namesake than most constellations. Okay, let's take one final trip back through our T charts, just to make sure that you have everything. Notice our asterisms, the Summer Triangle, the Northern Cross, and then the Teapot. Those are our asterisms. Then our constellations, Lyra the Heart, with Vega and M57, the Ring Nebula. Cygnus the Swan, with the bright star Deneb in its tail feathers. Aquila the Eagle, with the bright star Altair in its tail feathers. Delphinus the Dolphin. Sagittarius the Archer, with M8 and M20 up above it. And then Scorpius the Scorpion, with the reddish heart of the Scorpion, and Terry's. Okay, these will be your final two grades of the year. Your SC001 is worth 10 points, and your 001T is also worth 10 points in two separate assignments. Thank you all so much for taking astronomy this year. I'm sorry we did not get to the skies of fall, but we will save that for our next adventure. If you're really interested, just email me on the side, and I'm happy to shoot you the vocabulary list for the fall sky as well. All right, have a great summer, teens. This is Mr. Krug. Peace.